at the end of the presentation. So this is male survivors part two. And these are our objectives for today. So first, we're going to analyze the traumatic impact of sexual violence. Then we're going to identify the best practices and cultural considerations for serving male survivors. And then yeah, lastly, we're going to utilize these um, learns skills in a scenario. Oh, and I just wanted to say, again, if you weren't able to attend yesterday's training, we're going to go through a very brief recap of what we talked about. But again, if you weren't able to tune in, it might you might feel somewhat lost um, when going through the content today. So again, if you have weren't able to attend yesterday, just wait until it's uploaded to our YouTube channel. So a quick recap. Men experience sexual violence at higher rates than most people realize, and rape culture socializes boys and men even before birth. Rape culture also influences men to practice toxic masculinity, and toxic masculinity also contributes to the monolith picture of who a man is. And men are supposed to be, according to rape culture, aggressive, violent, and dominating, insatiable, or always want to have sex, and men are people who can never be emasculated. Men are also victim blamed and deal with rape myths in a way that's specific to men, and they really center um, around masculinity and being a victim. And then men also experience specific barriers when it comes to reporting and disclosing sexual violence. Now we're gonna talk about the traumatic impact. But before we can really do that, we have to define what trauma is. We at the coalition define trauma occurring when the body experiences more than it can handle. So each of our bodies handle and can handle different amounts and different intensities of things before it's reached its limit. And because all of our bodies function, process information, and react to stress differently, no two people can respond to trauma the same. So let's say that I, after everyone gave me back my evaluations and I'm sending out all your certificates, let's say I was going to send everybody a bag of peanuts. Um, so if you, and you can use your um, participant ID for this function. Um, please indicate yes or no if you would like me to send you a bag of peanuts. This is a hypothetical. I don't have that much money. I'm not that blessed. Um, but just put next to your name. There's a function that you can say yes or no. Um, please indicate whether you would like me or would not like me to send you a bag of peanuts. Raise hands works too. If you want me to, please raise your hand. That works too. Great, thank you all for um, doing that. You can go ahead and put your hands down now. Um, thanks everybody. I love it when everyone participates. And some folks even said no in the chat, which is great. Um, that makes sense. And for some of us, we would really love that. For some of us, we wouldn't like it at all. And for me, that would be very traumatic, right? Because I'm highly allergic to peanuts. So even though I offered each of us the same thing, we all will respond in very different ways. And it's the kind of the same thing when we come to trauma. And it really, really comes down to what our neurobiology and how our brain processes what's going on in the trauma around us. Um, so when our brain is processing trauma, a lot of the brain functions change. So when we are going through trauma, um, the bright blue part here that is our attention, planning, decision making, some of those more complex um, thoughts, and our memory processing start functioning very differently. When we're going through trauma, our brain is really focused on doing what it needs to, to survive. So this part of our brain, heart rate breathing, movement coordination, and our major senses are the only parts that really are functioning at maximum capacity. So our reptilian brain, which is this part right here, and the parts that allow us to do basic functions such as breathe, blink, move, are the part that is really in control because that's all our brain needs to survive. Um, a simple way to remember this is that if a baby can do it, that's what we can do when we're reacting to trauma. 
And because some of those complex thoughts and complex brain functions are not working as well or are not working to their full capacity, um, just trying to find my mouse, there we go, to our full capacity, it might impair the way our brain is processing memory. That doesn't mean that our brain isn't remembering things, but again, it's not at its full capacity, so it isn't functioning the way it usually would. So when survivors say things like, I don't remember, or I'm not sure what order it was in, or it seems like they missed some major details, it's because it's not because they're trying to be difficult, it isn't because they um, are just don't wanna answer people's questions, it's because their memory was not at full functioning capacity when they were going through the trauma. Our brain doesn't necessarily need memory to run away, to flee, or to freeze, right? So when we're talking about things like memory and survivors are trying to put their memories back together, we recommend two sleep cycles before survivors do any type of interviews um, because that allows the brain to reset, to function, to come back to full capacity. Um, we kind of explain a survivor trying to put, um, figure out these memories as buying a puzzle from a thrift store. I don't know if any of you have done this before, but if you go to the thrift store and buy a puzzle, you might not get the box that the puzzle came with. You might not um, get all the pieces that came in the puzzle, and you might even get some pieces that are bent so the puzzle doesn't go together right, just right, or the way that you think it should. That's kind of what it's like for survivors, right? There might be some pieces missing from the memory, the pieces might not fit together just right or in chronological order, or some things might be switched around. And this isn't because they're lying, it's because of the way their brain had determined that they need to survive, and some details weren't as important as others, but the survivor doesn't get to decide what the brain figures or processes as important information. And this really also feeds into how sexual assault survivors actually respond to trauma. Um, so people usually think that people will either fight or flight, right? And we really judge people off of these first two reactions. We even have phrases like, are you a man? Are you a mouse? Go big or go home? Nuck if you're a book, right? Um, but in reality, most people when experiencing trauma will freeze. 75% of sexual assault survivors experience moderate to high levels of paralysis during the assault. And this might help survivors to have this knowledge if they're blaming themselves, especially men who are taught that they have to be ready to fight, to be active, and to assert dominance at any moment. And we often hear from survivors that they had no control of their body and they wanted to move, but they just couldn't. And as responders, it's our job to let them know that that is a very normal response to trauma. Their brain made a decision in a matter of milliseconds to protect itself the best way it knew how, and it was beyond their control. And here's how one survivor described it. He was a senior aide, he had a direct line to the top. Being invited over to his house, I just took it as something I should, as I should go. Looking back, I asked myself, why didn't you do anything? It wasn't like he held me down or tied me up. I didn't want to cross him. I really didn't feel like I had a choice. I just turned 19. It could be my career. I froze and went along with it. And so when we're talking about some of those parts of our brain that were impaired, so that complex thinking and that memory, um, this is a part of the prefrontal cortex. And that impairment can last for hours after the assault. And this isn't to say that survivors aren't thinking through things or trying to make rational decisions. Survivors are thinking. It's just that their prefrontal cortex is not functioning fully. And again, if folks have questions, um, please put them in the chat box. Yeah, so someone said, just to be certain, I understand if a survivor of sexual assault reports, should we wait two sleep cycles to give deep, to have them give details? Am I understanding this properly? Yes, so if they're doing um, some type of interview, um, then the best practice is waiting two sleep cycles for that. 
Um, and if you all, again, if you all have questions, please put your questions in the chat box. And if you want to learn more specifically about the neurobiology of trauma, Victoria, please drop the link in the chat box. We, um, she just did a training about this, um, and it is on our YouTube channel. I blacked out in a sense. I'm crying in my mind the whole time, but I'm not literally bawling crying. But I know I'm tearing up because I don't want to do this and I don't want to be a part of this. But what should I do in this situation? And this is another quote from another survivor. Um, oftentimes we as outsiders to the experience might want to question or try to rationalize what this survivor might have been thinking or doing, but we have to remember that in a traumatic experience, our brains aren't functioning in a way that allows you to stop and think. Our brains are doing what it automatically needs to survive. <clears throat> and so this also leads to some of the traumatic impacts um, of sexual violence. And just to be clear and give credit where credit is due, we did not create this chart. Um, it was actually created by the Resource Sharing Project. And just like we're the technical providers for the sexual and domestic violence programs within Arizona, they are our national CA providers. Usually when we think of tra the traumatic impact of sexual assault, it's easier for us to think about those immediate physical and emotional impacts that show up right away. But in reality, sexual violence really does have an impact on all of these different aspects of a person's life. So their heart and mind, body, spirit, sexuality, and relationships. And these traumatic impacts influence each other. <clears throat> so for example, if someone's spirituality is being impacted by their experience, it makes sense that there might be some disruption in their relationships and in their emotional heart and mind. If someone's experiencing pain in their body, this might impact, impact their sexuality too. On a slightly different note, someone's relationship with, masculinity, with their masculinity after the assault can also be impacted in these areas. So another example, someone who might have felt physically vulnerable after the sexual assault might want to focus on getting physically stronger so they start working out excessively. Or someone might feel like they need to reestablish their masculinity by jumping back into having sex with their partner, but they keep getting triggered in their experience. Masculinity, just like trauma, also lives in each of these five areas. So we have to stop thinking of these impacts as completely separate entities and really look at the larger impacts they have when they're compounded. And I know I just now said that we have to look at these impacts more holistically, but breaking them down into categories for the purpose of this training is helpful to identify each of them. So some common impacts of sexual violence include physical ailments that might seem unrelated to the experience itself. So we have chronic pain, fatigue, exhaustion. There might be some gastrointestinal disorders. They might experience migraines and other frequent headaches, eating disorders, substance use or dependence. Um, some previous health conditions might be exacerbated and they might experience some somatic symptoms. So instead of saying things like my depression, my post-traumatic stress disorder and my anxiety are causing me issues, the survivor might say things like, I have these random headaches or I feel buzzing in my shoulder or I find myself always grinding my teeth instead, right? They might not be able to name the connection to what's going on in their psyche or in their feelings, but they can name that physical pain. And this pain might not be connected to the physical injury they sustained during the assault, but it is the way that their trauma is manifesting itself in their body. And some men also experience some suicidality and avoidance of health care. Men in particular who experience sexual violence commonly cite eating disorders, substance use, and suicidality as some of the impacts they experience. And beyond these particular symptoms, 
Sexual violence also elevates a person's adverse childhood experience score as well, also known as their ACEs score. And for those of you who aren't familiar with ACEs, it's an in-depth study that connects tra traumatic experiences people go through in their childhood, like being neglected or having a, a support person die or experiencing sexual violence to health disparities they experience as adults, such as heart problems, liver, liver disease, smoking, and other health issues. How I imagine carrying my weight is physical weight. I actually gained a lot of weight, and part of that was intentional. It's comforting for me to be heavier and less looked at as a sex object. I feel in my life I want to be smart, but I don't want to be attractive, right? And so we can see that even though there was a change in his physical body, it's really related to this survivor, um, to his heart and his um, emotional state. Here are some of the psychological impacts. So shame and blame, which you all named yesterday when we were talking about the barriers men face, irritability aggression, numbness, and um, for men and boys especially, we see rises in their irritability, aggression, hypervigilance, and anxiety levels too. Even if they don't ever verbalize these things, they still feel them. We also see men having trouble with sleeping and nightmares, hypervigilance, um, depression, anxiety, and fear, with PTSD and flashbacks, low self-esteem, substance use, hopelessness, and binary thinking. Um, and so, uh, so when we say things like binary thinking, we're talking about um, when a survivor might see that there's only two options in their mind, which might lead to irrational behavior or damaged relationships. So like if someone says, someone does either they love me or they hate me, I could put all my effort in or no effort at all. It's either us versus them. Again, a lot of the ways that, that boys and men show distress are directly related to how they're socialized to show emotion. And we know that, particularly in school, young boys are punished for this. These boys are seen as acting out or troublemakers or as bad seeds, when really they're just dealing with their trauma in the only way they know how. So as advocates and responders, we really have to analyze how normal responses to trauma are criminalized and how that impacts the people that we work with. And there are also many social impacts of sexual violence as well. And it's important that we know these because social support is often the most important protective factor for trauma. As humans, we have a need to be truly seen and heard, especially when it comes to dealing with our own trauma. So there might be some withdrawal or social, social isolation. And this especially might happen depending on if the person who caused harm is in their social circle and how the survivor's social supports respond to their disclosure. Also, sometimes their social supports might turn on a survivor or they might not feel equipped to support them to support the survivor emotionally, which can also be re-traumatizing for survivors. Many survivors also develop issues when it comes to concentrating and which leads to struggles with work or school and impacts on those relationships. Recently, a study found that there was a significant link between kids who had higher ACE scores and specifically ones with sexual and physical violence histories and ADHD diagnoses. And if we're thinking about it, that makes sense, right? If you're not able to discuss how you feel or have the language to tell people, you're scared, hurt, angry, and traumatized, it makes sense that you might not be able to focus or that you might be lashing out in school. There also might be a difficulty relating with others. So we have to think and think about and work with survivors with how that breach in a person's worldview and their trust to others close to them, close to them might affect their relationships and how this might be a way for the survivor to consciously or subconsciously try to keep people at a distance to keep themselves safe. I isolate. I don't go to the movies. I can't handle concerts. I have horror nightmares. Last Christmas, 
I went to dinner with some friends and at one point I started panicking so bad I had to get out of the restaurant. I was shaking. I never told anybody about this until last July. Do you know what it's like to live like this for 30 years? So even when we're focusing on the social impacts it might have on someone, this survivor also identified the way um, he was emotionally impacted and how it also showed up physically for him in the form of panic attacks. Sexual violence can also have an impact on sexuality. Um, even when it comes to consensual sexual activity, survivors can be triggered long after the sexual violence has ended. Specifically, it's, um, there might be some impact because of gender roles. In our society, and we talked about this extensively yesterday, many of us already have an unhealthy relationship with sex. Boys and men are taught to be sexual and that they can't experience sexual violence because of this. And this can make it difficult for many to learn, possibly for the first time, about healthy sex. There also might be some fear um, when it comes to having sex because of flashbacks or they're unable to stay in the moment. And there also might be some problems with arousal. Particularly for men, they might have trouble with arousal or staying aroused when it comes to having sex, which may lead to that person being fearful and avoidant of sex. On the other end of that spectrum, they might become hypersexual. And for those of us who aren't familiar with that term, hypersexuality is when a person over engages with sex and sexuality more often in a way that, that in the way that that person perceives to be negative or unhealthy. And I just want to make a note that as responders, I think we're a lot more comfortable with people who don't want to engage with their sexuality after the assault as opposed to those who still do, or those who are hypersexual. And I think as a group, we need to work to address this. I also just wanna make sure that I give a trigger warning for this next quote. Um, there are no descriptions, but there is a, there are no pictures, excuse me, but there is a brief description of sexual violence. As a man, I can't perform the way I used to. I feel damaged. All I remember, along with the pain, is the slapping sound of being raped. I try to make love to my wife, but I can't. I'm traumatized. I'm triggered. I'm traumatized by that sound. So again, we're, even though we're talking about the impact directly that this had on this survivor's sexuality, there was also an impact on his emotional state, uh, along with the relationship with his wife. So returning to this chart that we saw in part one, um, let's get a fuller picture of Akiro's life. So Akiro was sexually abused as a child by his troop leader. Akiro told his parents what was happening when he was 10. Akiro was taken out of the scouts, but it was the last time his parents spoke of the sexual abuse. He came out to his family as bisexual when he was 15. His older brother, then blamed him for leading on the troop member and quote unquote causing problems. Later on, he was sexually assaulted twice during university. And then he noticed after that that he started having sex more often. He left university during his senior year and immediately after that, he began having difficulty sleeping and he lost a lot of weight. After an injury, Akiro became addicted to opioids in his 30s. He was later arrested on drug charges. Once being released, Akiro didn't want to take his prescribed anxiety medication and struggle with anxiety for the rest of his life. And that makes sense if he, if, um, he developed um, a drug dependency and then he was later drugged for it, right? Or jailed for it, excuse me. After that, he was sexually harassed by his parole officer in his 40s and he was diagnosed with congestive heart failure at 58. So remember we talked about the ACEs score. Um, there is a link between those who experience um, traumatic factors as a child and some of those health disparities and some of them are heart problems. But still, he didn't talk about any of these sexual violence experiences with his partner until near the end of his life. So when we look at Akiro's life through this context, we can see how sexual violence might have had an impact in these otherwise unrelated events. 
if we just talked about the violence he experienced, we would miss the health and social factors that impacted his life and all the trauma he experienced. For a kiddo and many other survivors, sexual violence can touch all aspects of their lives. And as responders, we need to one, understand this and the ways trauma might manifest, and two, have a diverse set of resources and referrals ready to address some of those effects. But what are some of those appropriate responses to trauma? How do we talk about response and healing? And what should I do or how should I respond if someone tells me that they've been sexually assaulted? So we're gonna watch this video. I was sexually abused when I was about eight by an older male cousin. I've been sexually assaulted on four different occasions. I was six years old the first time that I was molested. A neighbor named Hank took me into his house. And at first it was hugging, and then his hands traveled. And when I tried to push him away, he beat me. And then he raped me. And I was haunted by the fact that this happened in a little girl's bedroom. For a long time, I blamed myself. I was just angry because I'd go to school and nobody in school knew what was going on. When I tried to tell my mom, she kicked me out of the house and laughed at me and told me I would never deserve anything better. It became something that lasted until I was 17 years old. I remember after it happened and after he left, sitting on a bed for a while torn up and saying, I am never going to tell another living person about this. I went and got my friends and I drove them home. Thank you for reading that, Katrina. Thanks. Now, if you had the chance, how would you respond to this person's story? I just feel like, or just like, hug her. <laughs> um, and just let, you know, let her know it's not her fault. You were a little girl, but it's not your fault, honey. You actually have the chance to meet that person because they're here today. This is James Metters. This is Mark Godoy Jr. This is Isaac Andrade. This is Walter Castaneda. This is Glenn Hall. He served in the Army for 30 years, retiring as Command Sergeant Major. And what you just read is his story. My name is Glenn. What you just read was his story. Oh my God. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Doing good. <laughs> Thank you for reading my story. I know the statistic is one in six. I'll go into a room and I'll count six men. I'm like, there's somebody else in here. And they're probably dealing with it the same way I've dealt with it, which... Okay, so we're gonna move on because um, we have limited time together today, but we saw there how um, some of those negative responses really impacted some of these survivors. Um, and this video is from One in Six, and it can be found very easily on their website with a simple Google search. It's very powerful. I always tear up. I teared up right now when I was watching it and I've seen it very many times. Um, but if you want other resources, one in six is a good place to start and they are linked at the end in the resource section. So don't worry about writing it down. But the first response to a survivor is the most important. When someone gets a, a positive response, they're less likely to feel depression, anxiety, and PTSD. They're more likely to get help and they're more likely to report to police, sorry. <clears throat> Remember that for a man, you may be the first person they're telling about their trauma, especially when they've been taught and everything has taught them in society to hold it in and deal with it on their own and deal with it like a man. So we need to make sure that we're respecting, we're respecting their disclosure and we're listening deeply to what they're telling us and also to what they're not telling us. 
So we need to make sure that we are comfortable with providing that emotional validation. I understand why you would feel that way. You can feel however you want about what happened. I'm not here to make judgments, I'm here to support you. If you were doing drugs, that's what you needed to do to survive. That's terrible. I can't imagine my friends deciding that they didn't want to talk to me after I disclosed. And that makes sense. It's okay to be angry if you weren't able to get the police report. Like that makes a lot of sense to me. On that same note, we as responders have to have the language to talk to survivors about arousal as well. Um, particularly for men, someone getting physically aroused or erect when they're being sexually assaulted does not mean that they consented. Arousal is a physiological response, which means it happens without our conscious thought. So just like our knee jerks when we're hit with that doctor with the doctor's tool or our body automatically freezes, arousal is our body's automatic response to stimulus. And we should have some language ready to talk to survivors about it. Just because your body was aroused doesn't mean you consented to what happened. Again, we have to let survivors know that they are not responsible for their assault and they are also not responsible for how their bodies reacted to trauma. I haven't heard that before, but that doesn't make it any less true. I've heard similar things from other survivors. So again, bringing up that sameness and how normal um, ev how normal everyone's responses are, even if they are different, um, might be helpful for survivors. And this might be some other things you could say that affirm someone's masculinity. So after sexual assault, some men might be struggling with both their identity and masculinity because they are so tied together for a lot of folks. Thank you for trusting me. It might be hard to, I know it might be very hard to be vulnerable. There are a lot of different ways to be strong or to show strength. Holding it in doesn't have to be your way. Sexual assault can happen to anyone, including other men. It's not your fault. It was never your fault. And someone, and everyone needs support at some point. You don't have to talk to me, but I hope you will talk to someone. It's important for advocates to talk to people to talk to the people they're working with about this and make sure that we're reframing, reframing masculinity in a positive way. And this could be things like uplifting mass, uh, resiliency, independence, being action oriented and solving problems while redirecting, challenging and unpacking, and unpacking ideas of dominance, aggression, strength and vulnerability. And this all takes practice and using some of these phrases. So please use the phrases that feel the most natural to you. Practice doesn't make perfect, but it can help you build up your skills in your advocacy toolbox. I can't tell you what to do, but we can go over your options together. I'm not here to judge you, and someone will be available if you ever want to talk. We also need to make sure that we are providing options as well. Have you thought about talking to your friends or family? And this is really about identifying some of their support people or who, are, who is available to provide them support um, within their social groups. Have you thought about making a report? Would you want to? We can talk about these options if you would like. Um, if we don't wanna lead anyone with our suggestions, right? Within the state of Arizona, if someone is over the age of 18, they do not have to report sexual assault. But we do want to give and make sure there are as many ch choice touch points as often as we can. Um, so you can replace reporting in this bubble with um, talking to behavioral health services or going to therapy or talking to a counselor or just going to a medical appointment, right? It can be whatever you want, but we want to make sure that we're identifying all the options for survivors. But at the end, we want to make sure that we're following up with, I'll support whatever you decide to do. It's important that we remember and we're reminding survivors that whatever they want to do next is their choice and that we are there to support them. So I identified some things to say, so we wanted to outline for you all also some things not to say. Why would you let them do that? Well, it sounds like you were being kind of aggressive. You're being too emotional about this. Like, 
You're being angry. Calm down. Are you sure that's what happened? Because that's not what you told me last week, right? We want to avoid asking these why questions because they can be accusatory and can be interpreted as victim blaming. We don't also want to make excuses for the for the person who caused harm. It's not helpful. It's actually very harmful. And it is never the survivor's fault. So we want to avoid these things. Yeah, so I saw Mariah said, I think the phrase that can be used instead of I understand is I hear you. I found numerous survivors become upset because we don't understand what they're going through. Each situation is completely different from the next, even if they experience the same assault. Just a thought. Yeah, definitely, Mariah. Um, yes, I have had both of these experiences. Um, when I say I hear you because it, it gets so ingrained, I say I hear you, I hear you. Um, instead of saying, I understand, but again, use what works for you. And if the survivor says, have you ever experienced it and you have it, you can say no. It's the best policy to be honest and say, no, I haven't experienced it, but I can see how whatever they describe could be difficult, right? Again, it's whatever you're comfortable with saying um, and whatever is best for the survivor. Thank you for that. So, if you still aren't sure how you should respond to a survivor and a male survivor when they disclose sexual assault, the first thing we need to do is believe them, right? Our job, unless we are law enforcement, is not to investigate if or what they're saying is true. Your job is to assist them without judgment or without doubt. Um, it's our job to provide acceptance and understanding. And no judgment. We don't provide our opinion on a survivor's actions, we only educate and help survivors identify options and resources. We validate. Um, we highlight the survivor's resiliency even when they may not see it. Remember, because we aren't standing in judgment, whatever the survivor did to make it to us is what they needed to do to survive. And then lastly, we listen. A lot of the times, sexual assault advocates especially feel like all they did was listen to a survivor, but they haven't helped them because their assistance isn't those tangible things or they haven't given the survivor anything. Um, but really, they have, right? Empathetic listening is a skill and it's not something that all people do well. Sometimes survivors all only need us to listen, not give advice, which we shouldn't be doing anyway, or give our opinions. Our job is just to believe, period. And now we're gonna get into some of our cultural considerations. And I know this is what um, a lot of you actually came to the training for and expecting, um, but if you really want to learn how um, for advocates to serve male survivors in the context of coordinated community response, um, I would definitely check out the 2018 Arizona Recommended Guidelines for Coordinated Community Response to Adult Sexual Assault. Um, so now we're going to go through the changes that we can make personally as advocates in our organizations and in society to serve male survivors better and more holistically. But I'm going to pause right here just to make sure I didn't miss any questions. So the first thing, what can we do internally to make sure that we are serving male survivors better? We can, we can use gender neutral pronouns. Um, and that means not assuming that the relationship between the person causing harm and the survivor is male female, because we know that that is not everyone's experience. But that also means that we can still make an effort to ask a person their pronouns and we should be. Um, as well as making our own apparent, like putting them on our name tags and our email signatures and using them in our introductions. We should also be examining our use of language. Language is very important and men may not identify with some of the terms we use like rape, sexual assault, or even victim. Um, in an article I read, a survivor didn't identify as a victim because he, quote unquote, a victim is someone who died from it. And so he didn't think that was him, right? 
We also need to make sure that we're doing research on male victimization. Because there's so much information out on the internet now, you can also gain a lot of information from books and articles. Please, please, please do not make someone, especially a survivor, feel like they need to explain their entire experience to us or educate you on how to provide services to them. Remember, learning and educating yourself is a part of that cultural humility process. We don't want to be transactional. We want to be investors of our time, ex expertise, and resources. Here are some more internal considerations and personal work that we could be doing. We should be challenging our own views on masculinity. We all have our own work to do to learn some of those toxic masculinity and patriarch patriarchal, I always struggle with that idea, um, that word, sorry y'all, and practices that affect our work and services, and we have to address them. If we're not constantly evaluating ourselves for this, we're not being trauma-informed. We also need to understand how victim roles affect feelings of victimization. Um, this training should just be a start to get education about male survivors and just how our cultures and our, our cultures evolve, our understanding and services should be evolving, right? Our understanding should not be identical to what it was two years ago. We have to continuously do the work and, and evolve when it comes to providing our services. We also need to reflect on our own comfortability when it comes to working with men. Sometimes it's hard to align our personal truths and what we're feeling internally with the facts. A lot of us are coming into this work as survivors and we have to be able to reconcile the facts um, and how we're feeling with that most men aren't violent. And then lastly, we need to make sure that we, this is more of an external thing we can do, but it's still something we can do personally. We need to be seeking out men as advocates, volunteers, and partners. Sometimes making that personal connection can also help undo some of the personal biases that we formed. But what are some things that we can do in our organizations to better serve men? Okay, um, so yeah, Charles said you can also use gender specific language when it comes to conducting outreach. Um, definitely. So we, that's, um, for I in this training, I've said men, because it's a male specific training, we're talking about male survivors, but definitely using they and being using gender neutral pronouns is best practice. Um, because we don't, we also don't want to assume someone's pronouns before we even meet them. So definitely. Okay, so some of these organizational considerations um, really start with evaluating our own communities. I will be the first person to acknowledge that there is an overwhelming lack of male specific services, especially with here in Arizona. However, that doesn't mean we are as responders are helpless and just should accept this. If we see gaps in our community for male specific resources, we should create them. We can start a male support group at our face centers. We can start a male support group online. We can do sessions with Boy Scouts about healthy communications. We can create graphics that talk to teen boys about consent. We can teach toddlers at the Parents and Me yoga class about bodily autonomy. We can do all of these, these things and we can create them, but they, these services need to be tailored to our specific communities. And because there are many different ways we can make male specific resources for our community, we should be doing so. And if there are supervisors or those who are in leadership positions um, in this training, we need to support our frontline staff in their creativity and their implementation of these services. But beyond just creating new services, these are some of the things we can do in our programs. Um, we can develop a outreach strategy that centers men. So we should be building strong relationships with fraternities, sports teams, Boy Scouts, gyms, bars, games for schools, and other faith institutions. Even if 
men are not going to these places and announcing that they need help or they're survivors or they want to heal, they are going to these places to socialize and find community, so we should be there too. And don't worry about listening and trying to write down everything I just said, all those places, they're included on the next slide and you all will get a copy of the places in that PDF. We should also have men in our materials. Um, so we should make sure that our materials and handouts are neutral colors or make some that are actually male specific. If you're looking for um, a good resource for inclusive stock photos, I would highly suggest you purchase a basic Canva subscription. And Victoria, if you can link the, um, the website to Canva in the chat, that would be great. Um, it's where I got majority of the photos for this presentation. Um, and they give you um, access to a whole bunch of different stock photos. On that same note, we should be having men, including boys and teens, review our materials and ask them what they think when they see them, right? Do they see themselves included? Would they come and use our services based on our outreach materials and on our website and who we have at our agencies? As an organization, we should also be seeking out men as advocates, volunteers, and partners. So along with creating that male-specific programming, like, um, like I mentioned before, but also chat lines and mentorship programs, um, we can be very creative in our programs. There's a lot of work that can still be done when it comes to sexual violence prevention, immediate response, and long-term healing. So there's a lot of room for creativity and growth. We should also be working with boys and teens about some of these topics, and that really feeds into this last point. Um, we could always use more access to response services, but it, would all, but it would be even better if we could prevent sexual violence before it even happens. And then we should also be having a discussion about toxic masculinity at our agencies. I touched briefly earlier about doing an inclusion audit, and this would be the place that you all could expand on it. So these are just some places to outreach. Um, so please take a good look at this list. And again, don't worry about remembering all of them or writing them down because you will get a copy of this slide. So it's not comprehensive, right? And it's not community specific, but it is a good place to start. And again, because we've already talked about in this training about how responses to trauma are criminalized, it is imperative that we outreach to detention and incarceration settings. And if you would like help forming or revising your outreach strategy because of COVID-19, I have linked our toolkit for doing so in the right-hand corner of the slide. So it's right here. Before I know I briefly touch on that discussion about how men are included in our services, but these are some questions to get that discussion started. How does your agency interact with men? Are there men who are frontline staff and volunteers? Do you have male specific spaces or male specific programming at your agency? And what community partnerships do you have that specifically include men? Um, so these are some good questions to start, but again, you need to base it on what your agency does and your agency's needs. So see, these are some of the things that our program here in Arizona is doing to include men, men in their services. Our successes have been an adjustment for participants and staff. Participants have been welcoming to our male participants and staff have done a great job in adjusting to having, to having and serving male participants on site. Due to the setup of our campus, we have been successful at accommodating our male participants in specific rooms and areas on our campus for both singles and families. An intentional piece has been the adjustment of our language, forms, and handouts to be gender neutral. But I really wanted to highlight the being intentional piece. Even before folks have had a chance to interact with our services, they can be encouraged or deterred by our different environments. And when I'm talking about environments, I'm not just talking about what our buildings look like or what our internal spaces look like. I'm talking about our website, our social media, and even how we answer the phone. If someone checks our website and only sees pictures of families or single moms or looks on our social media and only sees us emphasizing statistics about women and then calls our hotline and feel like they weren't listening or they were accused 
of being a person that caused harm, they're probably not going to reach out and look for services. Alexis, that is a great question. I am going to answer it at the end because I want to make, I think other people might have questions like that one. Thank you, though. <clears throat> Being inclusive of all genders is best practice, right? It really comes down to this simple fact. When we're being inclusive, we're being safe. It aligns with our value of, it lies with the values of trauma-informed care. It creates access for all survivors. It also helps dispel some of those gender stereotypes about those who cause harm and people who are survivors. It also re avoids revictimization of trans and non-binary people. If we are really reaching the last girl, the person in our community who is the last to receive support and most likely to be strategically removed from resources, um, then we are being inclusive. And if we're not continuously being inclusive, then we cannot call ourselves trauma-informed. And then lastly, we have our societal considerations. Now these are going to be very broad because they're things we can do as a society, um, but they still need to, to be added because we needed to have direction for what we can all do moving forward. So we can amplify and center the needs of survivors. We can also believe male survivors when they come forward because we know that society um, doesn't believe them and often makes them the butt of jokes. We can also support transformative justice efforts. So a lot of the reasons that some survivors don't come forward is because they don't want further harm to come to the person who harmed them because they care about that person. Um, so if we find other ways for survivors and let survivors define what justice and accountability looks like for them, then we might um, get more disclosures, which is not the goal, but also be able to provide survivors the services and support that they need. We also need to advocate for more sexual violence funding. Um, so there is no state funding right now allotted to sexual violence services in Arizona. So we need to be advocating for that funding. Um, but in the meantime, we can invest in some of these existing resources. So we need to be investing in our community partners and the advocates. Um, and in the resources that we currently have. We need to be supporting comprehensive sex ed, um, and we need to be advocating for male-specific services that promote healthy masculinity, um, and also consider how intersectionality and intersecting oppressions um, interact with rape culture, passive masculinity, and victim voice. Now let's talk about healing. We're almost done with the presentation, but we really have to have this discussion as a group about healing. Everyone deserves to find that peace. When we, um, we have to realize and address with survivors about how anger, trauma, and pain responses from men have been viewed as negative and help them unlearn some of these ideas. In addition to that, because men are not socialized to show emotion, it might take more time for them to not only verbalize, but to also address some of these feelings. So we have to have discussions with men and find men who can model what healthy relationships and communication, vulnerability, and strength look like. Men are also expected to be active, right? So sitting around and processing their trauma in a passive way might be difficult and we as responders have to understand that. So instead of jumping into bystander and intervention techniques that we've been researching for the past nine weeks, we might need to focus on how to build rapport and familiarity with that survivor or spend time talking about the survivor's interests first or maybe including some ways that the survivor um, to still feel active in their healing journey. And some of these things might be things like recording the changes they're seeing within themselves in a journal or recounting the conversations they've had with other people around them. It's really about reevaluating how healing can engage with their masculinity. 
And we also need to remember that it's different for every person and it may take time and effort to figure out what works. So back to our trusty chart again, there's areas of hurt that can also be areas of healing. And just how we talked about with the traumatic impacts, each of these parts of someone's being can, are connected and can affect how people heal. So I drafted some questions for you all to help survivors identify what might help them in their healing journeys. For heart and mind, what would help a survivor feel Okay, what would help a survivor feel safe and grounded in their own body and what will help them on their healing journey or find peace? And this could be things like trauma-informed therapy and music therapy and yoga, but it can also be things like martial arts and boxing. Um, a good place to start strategizing with survivor is about things that help them focus on their heartbeat and on their breathing. What resources can help for the body? What resources can help survivors meet their physical needs? This could be, um, I, this could be things directly related to the sexual violence that happened or their experience, like medical care and STI testing or sexually transmitted infection testing. But it could also be things that would help them meet their bodily needs like food, shelter, and water resources, and also getting them connected with a good exercise regime as well. But again, it depends on the survivor. For spirituality, what resources will help a survivor feel more connected to or repair their relationship with their spirituality? And um, this could be things like connecting, disconnecting, or reconnecting with their faith group. Or it could be things like meditation, because that's very spiritual for some folks. Or it could be connecting with their ancestors. This one really in particular is very dependent on who the survivor is. And I heard this quote on a National Clearing House webinar um, last week, and I think the speaker's name was Latrice Buck. Um, and she said, you do not have to be religious to understand someone's need for religion. So I just wanna emphasize that people's relationship with their faith can really influence um, how their healing journey goes. For sexuality, what will help a survivor feel more comfortable and in tune with their sexuality? And what are some ways that the survivor can express their sexuality in a healthy way? And this can be things like exploring their feelings like th about their body image or working with them about how to express their sexuality alone and with others and in a way that feels safe, healthy, and enjoyable. And then lastly, what in our relationships, what will help the survivor feel more connected socially, and what resources could help survivors build and, and repair relationships after trauma. This could be support groups, anonymous chat lines, healing circles, or just reconnecting one-on-one -on -one, um, with someone in their social circle, or it could be letter writing so that communication is a little bit more measured. Relationships are also a key part of someone's healing journey. And as we can see, some of these activities might affect the others. If someone's going to a support group, they might feel that social connection. If someone's connecting with their spirituality by meditating, they might also be connecting through yoga. So that helps their body and their mind by relaxing, right? So each of these things influence the other. So if we're having a discussion with a survivor about healing, um, here's some questions we can ask. What do you enjoy doing in your daily life? What helps you relax? Um, we might say healing looks different for everyone. It's okay to feel frustrated. Healing is in a straight line. You might feel up today and down tomorrow. That's totally normal. And there's no right or wrong way to heal. It's just your way. So if you're talking to a survivor for a first time, um, what would you say if they have questions or wanted to start a discussion about healing? Um, and please put your answer in the chat box. What would you say to a survivor who has questions or wants to start their healing journey? Or is even struggling with their healing journey? What would some of the things that you might say to them?
I'm here for you. How can I help? I like that, Carly. You're strong. You can do this. Yes. What does normal look like to you? Oh, I like that, Adam. What are you doing right now? When you're ready, we can find ways to cope and heal. I'm here for you. Um, there is no one perfect way. Yes, I love that. Try writing your thoughts down and you feel like you cannot express yourself openly. Yes, you are giving great suggestions, right? And even though I asked all of us the same question, we all gave very different responses. And that's why it's important that, um, that we have these discussions so we can learn from each other. I'm learning from you all right now. Your feelings are very real. Yes, validating those feelings, especially for men who might not be comfortable or not have had the chance before expressing some of these feelings. Thanks, everybody. Now we're gonna watch another video about the importance of support groups. Part of the best part for me of the men's project was not just talking, but listening. My fourth group at the men's project, I heard my first testimony and a friend of mine to this day. And it was, it struck me profoundly. He said out loud that he had been raped. And he had strength in his eyes. And I thought, holy God, there was eight of us in the room. He was looking proudly and talking about being raped. And I thought, holy shit. And I realized, I want what he has. I want that. It was an incredibly moving feeling of discovering, totally discovering for myself that recovery is actually possible. Well, I wasn't, it wasn't happening totally yet, but uh, I began to really believe that if I worked at this, my life would not be ruled, dominated, by my childhood, that the demons and the darkness didn't define me anymore. And um, I am a huge supporter of support groups, not only because it gives um, survivors a place to let out some of those emotions that they might be feeling, um, but it also shows what someone at the beginning of their healing journey, what someone might a little bit further along might be feeling or that healing is even possible. And again, we know everyone's experience is different, but someone who's went, been through something similar, um, finding that sameness and that closeness can really be helpful. Um, so this is something that came from one of the another programs in Arizona. Um, we have served male survivors doing outpatient trauma therapy since our inception in the early 2000s. Some of our therapy groups are female only doing, during, due to females being triggered by males in the, in the group, but not all are female only. In addition, we have a male only support group, which we find to be really helpful. So it doesn't just mean um, having only just having female support groups. And even though if our support groups say open support groups, the implied feeling of it is that it's female only. And a lot of male survivors know this. So when we have male only spaces, we can also have female only, only spaces. It's a both and, right? It doesn't have to be exclusive to one gender. So if you've also been in a training with us recently, you've probably seen this slide before, but please look because it's been adapted for men. Um, for a lot of survivors, connecting with their roots and their culture can be very helpful. Um, and for a lot of people, connecting with their culture is that healing. Once more, 
Survivors know what makes them feel better and we need to uplift that. We might be the experts with the resources, but they are the experts of their own experience and really what it will take for them to be healed. Our job is to give options and resources to remind them that healing isn't linear, it can be difficult, and that there isn't one way to heal. And because we all experience and interact with our trauma differently, the same can be said for healing. Lastly, just to make sure that point really gets in there, it is a part of our job as responders, as advocates, to be knowledgeable about different types of healing modalities and where a survivor can go to receive them. This, that warm and knowledgeable referral to these services is key. And because I am definitely a component of leaving you all with some tangibles, um, we are going to do a, um, a healing exercise that can be helpful for survivors. So you are going to need a writing utensil and something to write on, or you're going to need to be able to type out your responses um, for this exercise. It's gonna be very, it's gonna be fairly quick, so don't worry about um, getting line paper, it's going to be three different statements. Okay, so this activity can be done, I want to reference, in a support group um, by yourself, or you can either write this down and turn it into a journal prompt. So the first one is to say, I am blank, and you can describe yourself in one word. So it can be, I am happy, I am hurt, I am strong, I am sad, I am vulnerable, I am hungry, I am depressed, I am unsure, right? Whatever that person is feeling or whatever they feel they are. And I would like everyone to do this on their own. They definitely, you don't have to put in the chat box. Okay. The next one is to say and to write out, I have been blank. Um, I have been sad. I have been hurt. I have been vulnerable. I have been sexually assaulted. I have been taken advantage of. I have been hurt. I've been disregarded. I've been alone, right? And it's whatever description or action word that that person is feeling or they feel like they have been. And then the last one is I choose slash I will be blank and blank. I choose or I will be strong and happy. I, I will be peaceful and I will be loved. I will be acknowledged and I will be heard, right? It will be whatever that person is or you for right now, because we're doing this together, is moving towards or what they want to be. Um, and this can be really helpful because if it's written down, a survivor can track what they're thinking um, during every time they write it, right? And we can see that progress along their healing journey there. Um, I really love this one because it's short, it can be modified, and it can also be repeated or said more than once um, if that person is trying to ground themselves. Like, I am, I am Lache. I have been hurt, I will be strong. I am Lache, I have been hurt, I will be strong, right? And it can help ground that person and help them come back to a regulated state. And like I said before, it's gonna also be turned into a journal prompt if we done by yourself out loud or it can also be done in a group. And I um, did not create this, and I learned this against sexual assault at their conference this year. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes together. Um, so we're gonna go through a scenario, a couple of scenarios and apply some of the things that we've learned over the next couple of, uh, over the last two days together. So there's going to be a phrase on the screen and in the chat box, I would like you all to respond how you would if someone, if a male survivor said these phrases to you. 
Does that make sense for everybody? If it does, please raise your hand. If not, I can, um, yeah, thank you all. Okay, it looks like it's resonating for folks. Great, okay. And if not, hopefully you'll get it after we go through a couple of rounds. Okay. So how would you respond if someone said this to you? I'm straight, I like women. Does this make me gay now? And please put your responses in the chat. You all are some great advocates. Um, it's making me smile, read some of your responses. So we have, um, someone said, what do you think it means? This doesn't make you gay. Your sexuality is not defined by your experiences. A couple of folks said no. Um, Jacqueline said, you are human. You are human, experiences make us human. What, you, um, someone said, what is your definition of gay? Um, someone said, no, the, experience, the abuse you've experienced does not determine your sexual orientation. Um, someone said, it doesn't make you anything. You are a human being deserving of love and respect. Um, someone asked, would ask the survivor, is that how you see yourself? Um, what happened does not define you, but what do you think it means? Asking questions. You all did a great job. Um, I would definitely encourage like asking questions right? Because we don't want to necessarily tell someone no. Um, we want them to define it for themselves. So asking questions like, what do you think it means? And just reaffirming that um, who they are is who they determine themselves to be, not what happened to them. And most of you definitely got that. It is up to self and no one else. I love that answer. Okay. Let's, thank you, everybody. We're going to do another one. Um, When my caretaker forced herself on me, I still had an erection. Doesn't that mean deep down I still liked it? How would you respond to a survivor who said this to you? Your body's chemical reaction does not define your emotions. Your body reacts to stimulus. Being erect does not mean you enjoy the hurt that was caused. Magical, oh sorry, natural physical response to stimulus doesn't determine your feelings. Only you can do that. I really like that one. Um, this is your body's physical response. It does not mean that you liked what was happened to you, definitely. Uh, arousal is not an indication of consent. This is a physiological response that is not anyone's control. I love how you are really emphasizing that consent and the, that consent and that um, arousal is just a bodily function. That's great. Thanks, everybody. Um, your body had a physiological reaction that's beyond your control. Only you decide if you liked it or whether or not you did, or only you can decide if you liked it and whether or not you did is irrelevant. You didn't deserve to get taken advantage of. Yes. And yeah, and, and really, again, I want to emphasize that that is a nat your body's natural reaction is not something that a survivor can control. 
it's if someone did not consent, then that is sexual violence. Um, we're and this is the last one we're gonna do for today. All my life, I've pretty much just been coping. It's hard enough to come out as trans. I don't know how to handle this too. What would how would you respond if a survivor said this to you? One day at a time. It sounds like you've been through a lot. Remember to take it one day at a time. It takes strength and courage and resilience to survive everything you have surviving life to now. You survive the trauma, you can survive the healing. Oh, I memory, that was, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that one. I've never heard it said like that. I love that. Um, handle it when you're ready. Yes, definitely, because everyone heals at their own pace. Um, it sounds like you're dealing with a lot. Why don't we take it one step at a time, but it's not so overwhelming? Yes. When I was little, my mom used to always tell me, how do you eat an elephant? And I'm obsessed with elephants, so that makes sense. And the response was one bite at a time, right? We want to encourage survivors that it might seem overwhelming, but if we process it and process it in chunks, then it might be more manageable for them. Um, I would start with commending you and your strength have cope with the situation. Let's take a look at some options and think it one step at a time. That must be difficult. Yes, sharing your experience is the first step. Healing doesn't have to be immediate. Thank you all. You all have very good responses and I'm, I'm very encouraged by seeing how you all responded today. Um, so that's it for the content of this webinar. When I send out the resources, um, you all can check some of these out. Um, these on this page are resources and toolkits. Um, so you all can check out some more individual ways to serve male survivors better. And these are some more resources. I really encourage you, if you want to do more research or re have more resources for men, to check out one in six.org. Um, they have online support groups, they have resources, they have book recommendations. They're an awesome resource when trying to reach male survivors. Um, and I've also included some different books and a podcast there. And also um, a group here in Arizona, Arizona that does a lot of work with men specifically, um, the Surviving Network of Those Abused by, Abused by Priests. And they have two chapters in Arizona, one in Phoenix and one in Tucson. So that is it. Um, if anyone has any questions, this will be the time to put the to ask them now. Um, and I'm gonna answer Alexis's question that she asked earlier. Some females are uncomfortable going to a DV shelter because now men are acceptable. How do we make all of our survivors feel safe and included? Um, I think that comes with doing our own work specifically around letting people know up front that men are included and we want all people to be safe. Um, and also setting the foundation that violence will not be tolerated in your spaces and that everyone here is a survivor. And also, again, all survivors, all survivors have a right to be safe and to seek shelter. Um, and also doing some of that work in education around, around, um, around about, sorry, around the statistics about men who actually are violent. And it's not the vast majority of men, only a few men in the vast majority are actually violent. Um, Victoria, can you please drop the answer, the chat, the evaluation in the chat, please? 